Hey, it's Mike here, and today, when peeing gets hard, I can't help but think of that scene from Zoolander, one of my all-time favorite movies. My prostate's flaring up like a freaking ticky twitch. Give me a little pee-pee. Come on, a couple of drops. Yes, we're talking about an enlarged prostate, also known as benign prostatic hyperplasia, and it's not my main demographic that usually suffers with this, but you probably know somebody who is in that demographic, or you might know somebody at some point, so definitely pay attention because there's a lot of good info in this one. We're gonna learn the basics, like the factors that drive it, and also the choices that could potentially reduce the risk or severity in a rare cases, and so let's just go. I also have some crazy post post-tornado lighting situations here in Iowa. So this video is gonna be a little bit late, but we're going to be looking at the factors that drive the growth of the prostate, the choices that could potentially prevent BPH from happening, and so much more, let's go. And the B stands for benign, which might make you think there's no risk or issues with it at all, but that's just referring to how it is not cancerous growth of the prostate, so it's a benign, not malignant, but not benign in the sense that there can be a lot of urinary issues, like having problems peeing at all, having to go a lot of times in the middle of the night, which is actually the main complaint, and also things like urinary retention, which can lead to like infections and issues like that. So how does this actually happen? Well, the prostate it wraps around the urethra, also known as the P-tube. There's probably another video site out there by that name. Do not look it up. But as you can imagine, as the prostate grows, it puts pressure on the urethra, which doesn't allow urine to pass as easily. But amazingly, a lot of people who have a larger prostate than they're supposed to do not actually end up with symptoms, which we'll get into later. And this is insanely common. We're talking about 50% of men by the age of 50, and then it goes up to 80% by 80. No, it's 1% per year at that point, and then we're talking about a billion dollars to treat this. And Dr. Greger, nutritionfacts.org, did cover this a while ago, and he hit on some very interesting points, like how this was essentially non-existent in China in the early 1900s with around 80 cases reported in the entire country in a decade when their population was about half of what the U.S. is today. And I think that's really important to note because a lot of people think it's predetermined that they're supposed to get this as they age. That's just what happens. But nope, that's a huge point against that. But the Dr. Greger video is a bit older and it leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Like, how does this even happen in the first place? You know, how do hormones play a role? And are there particular foods that are good or bad for it, we're gonna cover all of that. For the cause from this paper, several biological factors, including oxidative stress, inflammation, androgens, which are sex hormones, as well as multiple growth factors, have been implicated in the disorder. Yes, inflammation itself could trigger cascades that lead to growth, but we're talking about a male reproductive disease, so we have to talk about hormones, the first of which is testosterone. It appears that this requires the presence of testosterone at some level to occur. 5-alpha reductase turns testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is a more potent form, which can enlarge the prostate. Something that I've covered in detail with its connection to male hair loss or just androgenic alopecia in my hair video, I'll link that below. So like with hair loss, people have been looking to 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and one that we've known has been beneficial in ameliorating BPH is finasteride, we've known that since the 90s. Interestingly, this doesn't seem to require high testosterone, looking to this chart. Yeah, it is the case that as BPH increases in prevalence over time and age, the level of testosterone these people have actually drops. And most ironically, higher levels of testosterone are actually associated with lower levels of BPH, which it might just be an indicator of higher overall health status. But it seems like all of the hormones are working against us here because estrogen is also a hormone that can stimulate prostate growth. However, in different forms, it can actually inhibit growth. And then next up, we have insulin from this paper. High insulin has been suggested to be causally related to the development of benign prostatic hyperplasia. And finally, we have insulin-like growth factor, which I talk about a lot in its role in cancer, et cetera. Well, in this case, high levels of it are also associated with BPH. And looking at this study, having higher levels of IGF-1 meant nearly three times the risk of BPH, which is huge. 
moving forward, obviously people should see their urologist about you know medical interventions and whether or not medications can be making it worse because some of them do. But moving past that, there is also various lifestyle factors, choices that have an influence. Starting out with lifestyle changes, you gotta talk about exercise and from various studies, exercise is at least associated with a lower risk of getting it. From this study, exercise is associated with lower symptoms such as excessive night peeing, AKA Nocturia, which sounds like a cool vampire name until you know what it means. I am Nocturia, I will pee on you in the night. And from this study, men who walk two to three hours a week had a 25% lower risk of BPH. And interventions for exercise are hard to come by, but here's kind of a cool one, a six month intervention pilot which did the exercise Yi Jin Jing and found that the prostate symptom score and urinary flow rate increased in the exercise group. And that's pretty cool. You just gotta do some flowy movements and then you can get the flow flowing. But now let's go to what I tend to talk about the most and that is diet. We have various food associations, good and bad here, which can give us an insight into the total dietary pattern that can be beneficial that we'll get into later. Firstly, starting with Red meat from this study. Yeah, compared to less than once a week, men eating red meat at least daily had a 30% increased risk of BPH. And from this paper, studies demonstrate that a high fat diet accelerates the generation of reactive oxidative species and oxidative stress in the prostate. Hopefully you saw my video on the fat hormone leptin and the role that it plays. Well, it might play a role at signaling excessive prostate growth, making it a possible key link between Western lifestyle and prostate diseases. And that is a hormone that is produced by your fat. So the more fat that you have, the more of that hormone is produced. And also from this paper, consumption of certain fatty acids, particularly of animal origin, has been correlated with increased prostate problems. Once again, echoing that fat is hormonally active tissue that can exert prostate effects that are negative. And finally, fat itself has estrogenic effects. And as I mentioned before, estrogen could be playing a role in prostate growth. So it's getting hit from several angles here. And from this Greek study, butter and margarine, but not olive oil were associated with an increased risk. However, fruit was associated with a lower risk, which brings us to some beneficial foods. In addition to fruit, vegetables are, you guessed it, associated with a lower risk of BPH. And one in particular is the onion family, which from this study, was associated with a ridiculous like 60% decreased risk of BPH for high onion family consumers like garlic. Now, sometimes we like to think that certain foods that look like certain parts of the body have benefits like walnuts on the brain, carrots cut in half look kind of like the eye. Well, tomatoes loosely look like they could be sort of like a prostate and they appear to be highly beneficial. In particular, the antioxidant lycopene. From this study, it might have specific positive prostate effects. Quote, lycopene has beneficial effects on prostate and several mechanisms of action have been identified in laboratory and clinical studies. Yeah, we actually have this randomized control trial from Germany, which took people with BPH and gave them either some lycopene or a placebo. They gave people 15 milligrams per day of lycopene, which is roughly equivalent to half a cup of spaghetti sauce, so not an insane amount. They were inspired by the epidemiological study showing that higher levels of lycopene were associated with lower levels of prostate cancer cancer risk. And after six months in the placebo group, they saw a 25% increase in prostate size. And in the intervention group, the lycopene group, they saw no statistically significant increase in size. So it essentially stopped the growth in its tracks, which is amazing. And no, it does not appear that Big Tomato is behind funding this study on big prostates. Is this video even watchable after that? Well, if you care about the information, you'll keep watching. And that brings me to the gut microbiome. We have several studies looking into this, like this one saying, quote, much evidence suggests that the intestinal microbiota has an influence on various pathologies, including BPH and erectile dysfunction, which is new to me. And from this other study going into the mechanism, quote, substantial research has demonstrated that lifestyle factors, especially natural fiber-rich diet, provides an opportunity for prevention of prostate diseases. 
Which brings me to the dietary pattern, which is clearly forming here. And that is a plant-based diet, which has been, you know, as this Harvard article mentions, already shown to be beneficial for prostate cancer risk. So, you know, what's good for one prostate thing, probably good for the other one. From this paper, the researchers conclude that especially a fiber rich, which has to be a plant rich diet, could prevent prostate diseases. And this very recent paper proposed plant forward diets for male diseases, again, including benign prostatic hyperplasia. You know, it cites various studies on food associations like we just went over, but also an Italian study of 3000 men showing that BPA risks were inversely associated with consuming legumes slash pulses, citrus fruits and cooked vegetables, as well as polyunsaturated fatty acid intake and nuts and seeds. This 2019 review suggests a high vegetable, low animal protein diet to control BPH. And they refer to these dietary changes as quote, long known, but not widely adapted. That's too bad. And there are also other benefits of being on a plant-based diet. High LDL or bad cholesterol is also associated with BPH. Well, guess what? People on a vegan diet have insanely low ideal LDL or bad cholesterol. And we also have that IGF-1, which is boosted by animal protein, but not plant protein, unless it's like high levels of isolated plant protein. And finally, vegans are shown over and over again to have lower levels of inflammation markers. So if we can bring down that inflammation, whether it's through antioxidants or just not through as much inflammatory food, then there's a good chance you're gonna be stimulating less prostate growth. And yeah, we're really just talking about a diet that is made up of plant foods, such as tomatoes and lycopene, but just a higher overall antioxidant intake from this study on 3,100 foods. We can see that plants on average have 64 times as many antioxidants, animal foods just basically devoid of them. So in the end, if you're in trouble, eat plants. <laughs> I don't even know how you can keep watching this at this point. You know, the overarching data shows that, you know, plant food's good, animal protein, red meat, etc., is having a negative effect, through, probably through various hormonal effects, you know, fat accumulation and the other hormonal effects from that and on and on. You know, we know from older studies like that one in China that this does not have to happen. It's I'm sure a really horrible experience to have this. And so if we can prevent it or help people who have it, that is awesome. And between the lower inflammation and the antioxidants and just the associations of plant foods, that is why not just some random vegan guy on the internet, but these institutions and teams of researchers over and over again recommend a plant-based diet for benign prostatic hyperplasia. All right, let me know down below what you think about all of this. If there are any concerns or mechanisms or food influences that I left out, I'd love to know. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.